If you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you'll open them up to the book of um, Acts and uh, verse nine, uh, chapter 19. I was at a meeting not long ago, and the pastor, the minister was, was sharing and was talking about individuals who have long-standing opportunities, long-standing challenges, long-standing issues in their life. It seems like year after year, it's the same thing. Year after year, it's the same issue. Year after year, it's the same prayer request. Year after year, it's the same difficulties that they're having. And he had a statement for them that, that just kind of kind of shocked me a little bit. He said this. He said that uh, you need to go buy a ladder. And I thought the same way that you look in at me, I looked at him. He said, I thought, go buy a ladder. He says, you need to go buy a ladder and get over it. <laughs> and I said, okay, praise the Lord. So this morning, I'm going to help you buy the ladder to help you get over those long-standing issues, those long-standing challenges, those long-standing things that seemingly every year you deal with them, and it's year after year we're dealing with those same things. Acts chapter 19 verse 20 says, so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. And so this morning, we want to help you in un to understand that the ladder that has been afforded to you already there is God's Word. That word prevail means to get over, means to rise to the top, it means to ascend to a higher place. It means to have the, to exercise force, to have strength, ability, power, to overcome, to win the battle. It means to get the victory. How would you like to have victory once and for all over the challenges of life, over those things that seem to come year after year, week after week, sometimes decade after decade, and we're still dealing with those same things? I'm telling you this morning that if we will allow God's Word to come in and do its work, then we can get the victory, hallelujah, once and for all. You remember in the, the book of Genesis, it says, in the days of Noah, Noah they said that the waters began to come down. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. And uh, I felt like I was in the days of Noah just a few weeks ago when it just seemed like it rained for days upon days and the water was, was rising. And I thought it was going to get into our game room because it was covering the patio. It was prevailing over the patio. The word says that the waters prevailed over the mountain. The the, the waters got higher than the mountain. Listen, when you've got issues in your life and difficulties, you've got to have something that'll cause you to rise up and cause you to raise up and go higher than the issues in your life. You can't let those issues and those difficulties always prevail over you, over your thinking, over your life, over your finances, over your health. There is something equipped on the inside of you, and it's the way Word of God that'll give life to that and it'll cause you to prevail just like the waters prevailed over the mountains. The Word will cause you to rise up, to go over and win the battle, get the victory over every mountain, over every difficulty, over every challenge in your life. Can you say amen? Amen. The Word causes you to overcome, causes you to prevail, and we're going to look at several areas just a little bit. So what is it that the Word helps you to overcome? Look at verse number, uh, number 2 there in uh, I, I, Acts chapter 19, verse 1 says, And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit when you believed? And so they said to him, we have not so much heard whether there is a Holy Ghost. 
I want to tell you the first thing that the Word helps you to overcome is traditional thinking and traditional religious belief. It'll help you to overcome in those areas because sometimes we've been taught some things, we've been raised to believe some things that are not in line with God's Word. We've been taught sometimes that God wants to give you sickness and causes you to be sick so that He can teach you something. I'm telling you this morning that you can't learn anything by being sick, but you can learn that God wants you to be healed and, and wants you to be well through the Word of God. So it changes our thinking. Here were 12 men. They had not heard that there was a Holy Ghost. There is a whole, there are whole denominations who have put the Holy Ghost in the back room, who have said that the Holy Ghost isn't for today, that God doesn't go that, doesn't do that anymore, that the, that the power of the Holy Ghost in the book of Acts was so that the church could get started. Well, glory to God, if the church needed the Holy Ghost to get started, don't you know that the church needs the Holy Ghost to keep on going, amen? Just like you got gas in your car to get it started, you better have gas for the journey, glory to God. When you start running low, guess what? You got to fill it up. You just can't put gas in your car one time and keep it forever. Amen? So there are some traditional ways of thinking that the Holy Ghost, that, that, the, that the Word will help us to overcome. You see, sometimes, um, well, you know, you just can't expect God to do something in your life. Sometimes we've been told we're the wrong color. Sometimes we've been told we're from the wrong side of the track. Sometimes we've been told we don't have enough education. Sometimes we've been told, well, you're the wrong, you're the wrong sex. Sometimes you've been told, you, well, you're just too young. Sometimes you're told you're just too old. You've got to realize that those traditional ways of thinking, the Lord says that the Word will cause us to overcome those things. We'll jump over to verse number 9. Verse 8. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitudes, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. Now, I want you to realize the next thing that I believe that the, that the Word will help you to overcome is opposition. You know, every time the Word goes forth and goes into your heart, there's going to be somebody that's not going to understand it, not going to believe it. You're going to try to live according to the Word, live according to what you've learned, what you believe in your heart, and there's going to be somebody that's going to say, oh, that's just nothing but foolishness. You've been, you've been brainwashed. You've been this. You've been that. You're going to have to realize that there will be sometimes some of your own family are going to say, oh, I don't know, you're just kind of, you've, 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 you're going off the deep end with this religion stuff, with this word stuff. You're going to have friends that are going to say, they're going to want you to keep, they're going to want you to keep going to the parties and keep going to, going to the honky tonks and keep going to the, to the festivals. Uh, they're going to want you to keep doing what you've been doing because they don't feel guilty when, when you're around them doing what they're doing. But God says that the word will cause you to overcome even that type of opposition. And you know, realize that when, when you get born again, you make Jesus the Lord of your life and you start living the Word that sometimes you're going to have to pull away. Sometimes you're going to have to pull away. And actually what happens is you don't necessarily pull away, but the friends pull away from you. Because they feel condemned by being around someone who wants to live righteous before God, who, who wants to make a change in their life, who wants to get those issues that have been plaguing them out, of, out from over them and so they can get over those issues in their life. 
Sometimes you'll find business associates that are wanting to do things by their own book instead of by the good book. And they're going to do things, well, you know, it's business. We go to church on Sunday, but in business, this is business. And anytime you got to make a profit in business and anything that you need to make a profit in business, that's the way we're going to have to do it. No, there are some times that you're going to have to put your foot down and say, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. I tell you, one of the things that, that, that you know, that's, that, that I look, people look at me and, and think I'm, I'm kind of I'm crazy about it a little bit uh, is, the, is the fact that I, I, will not, uh, I will not download software that I haven't purchased. I will not download software from Microsoft or anybody's software that I haven't purchased and have the license for it. Because you realize that when you do that, you're stealing. Uh, at least that's the way I feel. Uh, I had one guy a number of years ago. He came and, you know, he was going to help me with my computers. And before I knew it, he had loaded up all kinds of software. This thing was, was singing every time I had an email. It was doing all kinds of crazy things. And I, when I came into the office and I said, what did you do to my computer? This thing is singing at me. Because I get, I get about 240 to 300 emails every day. Only three or four of them are worth anything. The rest of them are trash. <laughs> anyway, so I said, he said, oh, he said, I got all these nice little software packages that I bought. And he said, I just, I just loaded them up for you. I said, well, would you blindly unload them? Well, why do you want me to unload them? I said, because I won't put software on here that I haven't bought. It's stealing. Those companies have paid money. Now, that's the way I feel. If you've got other convictions, that's up to you. Uh, and, and, and so he just politely said, no, he wasn't going to do it. So it took me two days to go in and find all of those little things he had put on, some major packages and some minor packages, getting rid of them. Listen, sometimes... You won't be able to convince them that what you're doing is because of the Word. You've just got to live the Word before them. Amen? And let the Word do the speaking. Look at verse number 12. Verse 11. Now Paul worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. God worked unusual miracles by the hand of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and evil spirits went out of them. Listen, the Word will help you get over sickness and disease. It'll help you get over those things. It'll help you get over uh, evil spirits. Now listen, not everything. Every disease is caused by an evil spirit. But when it is, the Word will help you get over that. There are some times when just there are, there, are, uh, there are germs and bacteria and viruses out there that are not necessarily of the devil. I don't believe they were of God. But we didn't catch them as a direct result of sat satanic involvement or attack. But, we, but those things do come on us. And I believe the Word will cause you to overcome and help you to overcome in every single area of your life. Amen? And so we see that happening in this case. Look at verse number 18. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. And many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of, the, of them all. And they counted the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Listen, there's a, there are individuals, and maybe some of you have been involved in some type of witchcraft, some type of uh, seances, or some type of uh, um, occult practices. I'm telling you that the Word will help you to overcome even in those areas. You see, it's a matter of walking with Jesus and walking with the anointing that'll cause you to overcome, and staying in the Word will cause you to overcome even some of these things to the point where they were bringing all of their books off of the shelves and all of their activities, and they were bringing them, and they were being burned. And so the Word will cause you to 
to overcome satanic involvement, will cause you to overcome occult involvement, and it'll cause you to overcome in those areas. You see, uh, most people don't necessarily need deliverance. There are a few cases where we've seen it where people absolutely needed a deliverance. But most people don't necessarily need a deliverance. But what they need is a soaking in the word of God so that the Lord of death will flee. And so if I begin to soak in God's Word, allowing His Word to grow in me and prevail, then listen, the devil will no longer want to be in your presence, will no, no longer want to be in you because he'll begun to flee because he can't stand being where the Word is. Amen? We got to realize that the Word carries with it, within it, the power of and the anointing to bring to pass what it says it brings to pass. Whatever it is that the Word says it will do, it has the power within it to bring it to pass. At my house, I have two, three, eight oak trees. Some are very large and some are relatively small. But those oak trees all came from eight acorns, about the size of my thumb. Each oak tree came from that acorn. Now, I didn't plant the acorn. I bought them already partially grown. But you could take that acorn and look in it and say, there is an oak tree inside that acorn. And you think, no. Nah. It's too small. Well, you got to understand, it has to be planted. And once it's planted, it will grow. The Word says, and you can take a mustard seed, and it says it's the smallest of all seeds. It is so small, you, if you have just one seed, you almost need a magnifying glass to see it. But inside that seed is everything that that mustard plant is going to produce. Inside that acorn it are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of more acorns and hundreds of thousands of leaves and probably 100 to 150 years worth of life in that one little acorn. And you see, you've got to realize that the Word is a seed. And it's a living thing. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of sword and soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and the discerners of the heart. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 12, the Lord is talking to Jeremiah and he says, I am looking after my word to perform it. I am looking after, I am seeking my word. And when I see my word in the hearts of other people, in the hearts of people, I'm going to bring that word to pass in their life. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, the word says that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro, go here and there, go over the whole earth to seek who, someone whose heart is completely sold out to him so that he can show himself strong on their behalf. The Lord is looking for his word in your heart, in my heart, so that he can show himself strong through that word in our life. Do you see that? The word there says to grow mightily means that it is, it, the word is kratos. It means to have power, to have strength, to have dominion. The word grow means to from something that's very small to get very big. And so the thing is, you got to realize that sometimes when the word has to be sown into our heart, you may have heard this already. You may have heard this, and un, but, but I want you to uh, just to forget about what you've heard, but realize that every day you and, I, you and I have the opportunity to sow the word in our heart. When you come to church, you're not here just to take up space and breathe the air in this place. You're not just here to, to see and, and visit with the other people. You're here to be to become soil to have a seed of life sown into your heart 
And every time you listen to a tape or read a book or listen, watch a video and, and it's uh, something with the word, approach it from that perspective. I'm going to get something sown into my heart today. Every time you read the word and you begin to speak the word out of your mouth, you become uh, a seed sower. Remember Mark chapter 4, he said the sower went out to sow. You know, he had a purpose for going out. He had a purpose to sow. I believe that it is, it is intentional that we sow seed. It is intentional that we become soil that seed is sown into our hearts. It is intentionally done. It's not by accident. It is an intentional step. And then in verse 13, he says that the sower sows what? Sows the word. And so the word then becomes seed. And you're familiar with the, the four types of soil. Can you, do you mind if we take a, a few minutes looking at that this morning? Even if you do, we will. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so realize, he says, that the roadside, some of the seed fell on the roadside. Some of the roadside, it said it's, uh, uh, or, or uh, the word says the wayside. Well, uh, it means it's the roadside. It fell on the curbing, fell on the ditch. It fell real close to the road. Well, you know, and then he says that the, uh, immediately the enemy comes, immediately Satan comes, immediately birds come and pick up the seed because it was so hard. What causes a person's heart to become roadside? What causes a person's heart to become so hard that, that the seed, that the word can't penetrate it? Sometimes it's your past. Sometimes it's rejection. Sometimes it's bitterness. Sometimes it's offense. Sometimes it's issues and things that have hurt you, that have deeply injured you, that have, that have caused a scaling, caused a, a, a hardening of your heart. And sometimes it's a wall that you build up because of either, uh, you know, well-meaning people around you, uh, maybe teachers, maybe other students, uh, maybe parents, maybe friends who are so-called friends, Maybe issues, whatever it is, but sometimes it becomes those hardness, that heart becomes hardened. Sometimes it's traditional and religious belief and thinking that, you know, this is the only way and, and, and this new, this new thing. I've never heard being born again. I've never heard being filled with the Spirit. All oh, that things about speaking in tongues and all of that, you know, just rejecting new stuff because it doesn't line up up with your pattern of the way you were brought up or the way you were thinking. Sometimes that seed just can't penetrate through the crust that we've put into our heart. Satan comes and steal it. The word says in Matthew that they, they just couldn't understand. They didn't take the time to understand. You see, I believe the Lord said this, the very thing that will help them to overcome the hardness, the bitterness, the rejection, the hurt is the thing that Satan comes and steals. It's the very thing that, is, that, that they reject. It's the very thing that they don't allow to soak into their heart. And so sometimes we've been raised and issues been raised in, 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 uh, by, by parents who, who really thought they were doing right but really hurt some things. And we know that, we understand that, but you know the thing is what's going to help is the Word going in and then beginning to soften your own heart so that you can do something else. Sometimes our past hardens us to the Word. You know the, the, the other type, the second type of soil he talked about was the, the rocky soil. They, they received the Word with joy. Uh, but yet they had no root, no real foundation, no real depth of soil. And so uh, uh, over the time, the word says that persecution and tribulation and affliction and things come because of the, the word. 
And suddenly uh, they begin to back away from the word because they can't handle the tribulation. How many of you have ever felt, I didn't have this much trouble before I got born again? I mean, things, I, I, I mean, I had my troubles, okay. I had my difficulties, okay. But it seemed like when I got born again, it seemed like all hell broke loose against me. Does anybody ever feel that way? I, I, maybe I ought to go back to the world. Maybe I ought to go back to live the way I used to live. But we realize some people do that. I remember a number of years ago, uh, Pastor B and I had just made a transition from a denominational church into a non-denominational church. And after several months and going through their, 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 uh, their membership classes and, and being part, the pastor asked me to be on the altar worker team. And so uh, I was, and there was, a, there was an older couple. I say older. I thought they were older at the time. Now they'd be young. Uh, you know, uh, I was in my 30s. They looked like they would be in their, in their late 60s, uh, but actually they were just a few, old, a few years older than me. Uh, they had had a very rough life. Both of them were alcoholic. Both of them had been rejected, had some serious, real, real difficulties in their life. Uh, and they got born again, so I had the privilege of taking them to a back room and giving them some books and praying with them and encouraging them. For the next six weeks, I saw them in church, and they, it, it's almost like their skin got lighter color. It didn't literally, but there was something about their continents that just changed. And I was so excited to see them. I'd go t shake their hand and talk to them. I, it's been so many years, I don't remember their name now, but I can see their face. If they walked in that door, I'd recognize them. And so they came. But, but all of a sudden, on a Wednesday, I missed them. And a Sunday, I missed them. And the, Wednesday, the Sunday night, I missed them. So I called them on the Tuesday, and I said, hey, I missed you in church. Well, we're not going to be coming back to that church no more. I said, well, what happened? I said, did pastor say something and, uh, that, that offended you? Did, did, did something happen that you can't come? Yeah, my family wasn't inviting me to no more crawfish boils. I said, what? He said, they all claim we got religion and, and, and we, weren't, we weren't invited to their parties and we weren't invited to the family reunions and we weren't invited to be part of the family anymore. They were, they were kicking us out of the family and family's important, you know. I said, yes, sir, I know that family's important, but I said, the word of God is more important. And I said, the, the relationship with Jesus is more important. And so they were persecuted, and they went through some tribulations. And instead of just pressing on through, they backed up. Never saw them again. I don't know where they are. I don't know whether they're alcoholic again or not, but I can tell you this, that I've seen more than one person walk through and come through and get born again and get pulled back by that, by that spirit, get pulled back by, by, by persecution, get pulled back by the tribulation, back into the same lifestyle, and it's not weeks later they're back on the same stuff they were before, except this time it's a lot harder to get free. So the word... So the second type of soil is that stony soil. And then the third one he talked about was some thorny soil. That's the word that, that the, it's, it's kind of the worldly type. I have some good friends of mine that they were, they, and, and if I mention their name, some of you would know who they are. They were great people. They were ministers of the gospel. They were singers and musicians. And, and, and this couple would go out every Friday night, and they would minister the word on street corners and in parking lots. And they'd set up, and they got people born again. And they were just so excited. They were involved in the in the sound of the church and they were involved in the singing of the church and uh, but but you know they kept thinking if we could just make a little bit more money uh, in our business we we could possibly get to the place where uh, the the this 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 sideline business will support us so we can go full-time in the ministry 
And so they got more involved in their business and more involved in their business and more involved in their business. And so the carrot of the deceitfulness of riches, the carrot of the desires of other things, the carrot kept putting them in and drawing them further and drawing them further to the place where today they're divorced and remarried. Today they're neither one of them are in ministry and I'm not sure that either one of them are in church. Haven't seen them in years. But see, the desires of other things, the, the deceitfulness of riches began to pull them away with the thought, if I can just get it bigger, if I can just get it big enough to support me, then I can do ministry full time. You see, that's the seed was sown, but they were, had one foot in the church and one foot in the world, and they were straddling the fence. I'm telling you if, you, if you're living as a straddle on the fence, you need to make a decision, get on one side or the other, because you'll be the most miserable person on the planet Earth. You've got to get out of, the, get out of the, the world and get into the Church. Now, I realize, listen, I know that we, we all have occupations. We all have to work. But listen, it becomes your tent-making op uh, uh, obligation. You, 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 you work in the world, but you don't live in the world. You're not controlled by the world. You're controlled by the Word, and the, and the world will try to pull you in. But you've got to realize, yes, we've got bills to pay, and we've got uh, 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 things that we've got to have and we've got to eat, but it's not a driving force that we've got to have bigger and better and newer all the time. Does that make sense? So we've got to realize that we can't be, uh, have a half-hearted commitment to this thing. So, you know, and then the last one is the, is the good soil. Now, can you, how many of you can do some math? Some of you, you're not sure. It's not a trick question. <laughs> if you have four, one, two, three, four, and three of them don't produce anything, that means how much does produce something? One or 25%. So I could go, and for every four people, one of you, I'm not going to point at you, one of you is going to produce something. The other three won't. So the pastor looks across his congregation, sees a hundred people, or a thousand people, or ten thousand people, and says only 25% are going to leave with something. The other 75% just here for the ride. Oh my goodness, did he just say that? <laughs> and so the challenge is which one of the 25% is he going to preach to? See, I can tell on your face. And I'll look at you and say, yep, there's a 25%er. Nah, that's 75%. No, I'm just kidding. But, but, but realize, you know, that's what he's saying. Now, watch this. I said, Lord, I know that more than 25% of the people that come to Living Word Church, Living Glory Church, we used to be Living Word back when we first got started. I know that more than 25% receive something every Sunday. I believe that 100% of the people receive something every Sunday. They may receive just a, uh, oh, he had a nice jacket on. Oh, or, or, or they may receive something from the praise and worship. They may receive something, oh my, you know, I like that word. Uh, yeah, yeah, but they receive something. So I said, Lord, what qualifies them or me, me, not just you, but me when I sit in something, when I'm studying, when I'm getting, what qualifies a person to be a good soil candidate? And this is, this is what, what he shared with me. They allow the word to prevail in their life. Now, don't you, don't, now watch this. Didn't he say in that verse 
when we're talking about the soil, that the good soil will produce 30, 60, and 100 fold. Right? So that means there's a degree of the productivity. So what qualifies, how can I get to the place where I'm doing a hundred, per, hundred fold rather than thirty fold? Now Jesus just broke it that way, thirty-six, and could it be there's tenfold? Could it be that there's fiftyfold? Could it be there's twenty-five fold? I believe it's all. It could be any of it. So this is what the Lord, I believe the Lord told me, was that the degree to which you are able to uh, not let the bitterness and the resentment and the hurts affect you from receiving, receiving the seed to the degree to which you are able not to allow the persecution and the tribulation of stealing the seed to the degree that you are not allowing the world to come in and steal from you what the nutrients of the word to the degree that you're able to go through all of those three things, that's to the degree that you are a good soil. Amen. Amen. In other words, all of us, listen, you don't have the market on resentment. You don't have the market on rejection. You don't have the market on abuse. You don't have the market on somebody hurting you that no one else does. You're not alone in that. You, all of us, have had somewhere and somehow we've been rejected, abused. We've been misused. We've been persecuted. We've, we've had tribulation. We've had the opportunities to overcome just like you. All of us perhaps have had issues and, and, and oh, we've all got little beady eyes and we want more. We want more. We want more. You know, bigger car, better house, more of this, more of that. And the draw and the pull of the world trying to get us in. Listen, if you can overcome those challenges, if you can overcome Satan stealing the word outright, if you can overcome him trying to come from the outside and steal the word through persecution and tribulation, and you can overcome the, the word and allowing the word to overcome and the, tri the, 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 the heart's desire for better and bigger and nicer and newer, then, then you are then good soil. And it's going to be your degree. And so I'm good soil, but it's to what degree? And so it's not a matter of 25% receive it and 75% don't. It's a matter of how much of the degree am I allowing the Word to sink into my heart and standing on the Word so that it grows. And maybe... Maybe, let's see, it's sown, it grows, and the Word says that it becomes. Mark chapter 4, it says, To what shall we liken the kingdom of God, or what shall a parable shall we see it? It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground, it is smaller than all the seeds of the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs. It grows up and becomes, I want you to realize this, that when you sow a seed today, you don't eat tomatoes from the plant tomorrow. It said there's a season and sometimes the only, the only seed I know that you can receive an instant return on is a smile. And you smile at somebody and 99.9% .9 of the time they'll smile back. That was the one point is because they're from New York City and they look and they say, no, 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 I don't want you to, what you after? No, I'm just kidding. Partially. But, but you realize that when you sow a seed, listen, we're, we're, so, we're so accustomed to McDonald's going in. You order at the drive-thru. You pay at the first window. And you walk out with your bag at the second window. We're so accustomed to that. In our, in, in if, and we're so accustomed to getting on the Internet and clicking. And it's there. That's the selling point of the the, the new technology. We got it right now. But sometimes the word doesn't work right now.
Sometimes there's some things that need to take place in our life. There's some adjustments we need to make. And God says, if everything happened just that quickly, then we wouldn't have to make adjustments. We wouldn't have to change. Oh, my God. Change? What's that? I don't want to change. I like me just the way I am. But God says, I want you to change to be more of what I want you to be. Is that making sense? And so the word is that ladder that will help you and it will grow so that you can overcome all of the difficulties, all of the challenges. It becomes whatever you need. It becomes your healing. It becomes your peace within your heart. And the word says, regardless of what has happened, you be at peace with all people. How am I going to be at peace with all people unless I've got the word on the inside of me? They can act ugly. They can do what they want. I'm at peace with with them I'm at peace with me and it's only the word that can help do that it'll help you overcome the word says it'll take them it'll take it'll make a message out of your mess glory to God look at Jeremiah chapter 3 I'm sorry chapter 5 And the Lord is talking to Jeremiah and says this, Do you not fear me, says the Lord? Will you not tremble at my presence? You have placed the sand as the bound of the sea. Now get the picture. You have placed the sand as the boundary of the sea. By a perpetual degree, decree, that it shall not pass beyond it. And though its waters toss to and fro, yet they will not prevail. Though they roar, yet they will not pass over it. I want you to get that picture. The Lord has set up the oceans and the land. And it says that the oceans will not go over the land. They all have boundaries set, and that boundary is the sand. There are occasions when you have uh, what's called tsunamis, where these major tidal waves come in, and they may go in 20, maybe 20 miles into the land causing devastation everywhere it goes. But within six months, the ocean is right back to where it was. It, it receives, why? Because they might toss to and fro. It might cause uh, trying to come in and try to overtake the land, but it can't overtake the land. And why? It'll go back. I mean, we're familiar with the tidal waves from hurricanes. I mean, just not long ago when Hurricane, I think it was Hurricane Rita, came across south Louisiana and, and uh, Hackberry and Cameron and all of those areas. Now you go back there and there are $150,000 uh, homes that are put on stilts 13 or 14 feet up. Insurances won't pay for them unless they're that high. And so why? And so that when the water comes in, the houses will be protected. But you go back today, even just a few years later, a few weeks later, all that water has gone right back out into the Gulf. Watch this. If you'll allow the Word to take root in your heart, and you will stand on the Word, it doesn't matter if life tries to do you in. It doesn't matter if life and the troubles of life try to over, overcome you, try to go over the boundaries of your life, try to invade your life. And it may for a season, and it may look like it's all is lost, but if you stay on God's side, if you stay planted on the Word, I'm telling you today that your head will be above the water, and then your shoulders will be above the water, and the waters will recede, and it will not drown your life out unless you just take your root up out of the Word. Can you say amen? amen? So this morning I gave you a little ladder to help you get over 
some of the issues that perhaps have been long-standing. We put the word first in our life. I could have said all of that with just one sentence. One word from God can change the direction of your life forever. But then that wouldn't have made the service last long enough. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you today that as, as the people of the word, word people, Father, we choose to put your word first in our life. And though, those, though there have been issues, there have been difficulties, there have been struggles, Father, I thank you that the people in Living Glory Church, your people here this morning, will, are, are getting, making a new commitment, a new fresh commitment to your word, a new fresh desire to get your word planted. Because, Father, it is the equipment. It is the tool. It is the, 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 the equipment from the kingdom of heaven that will help us to overcome. And so say this with me, Father, I choose to put your word first. I choose to be good soil. I choose to make an effort not to let resentment and offense affect my life not to uh, allow persecution and tribulation to steal the seed, not to allow uh, other things and the desires of this world to choke out your word. And, Father, I'm shooting for a hundredfold return because I'm good soil. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, here this morning, just uh, we, we need to ask this and and. Uh, maybe you're already born again, but, you know, the whole, the whole process is started by us making Jesus the Lord of our life. Uh, without, without making that decision, then the Word is not going to have its effect on your life. So if you're here this morning, I just need to ask you, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you might say it this way, uh, You've committed your heart to Jesus. You've committed your heart for the kingdom of God. And so you might recognize, and one of the things you know, is that when you've done that, then heaven becomes your eternal home. If you don't know for sure that you made Jesus the Lord of your life, you don't know for sure that if today were your last day, then lift your hand, let me pray with you. If you don't know that you would go to heaven when you passed on from this earth, would you let me pray with you? Anybody, anybody like that here? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. The other two altar calls, one is if you're here this morning and you have know that you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, but for some reason and Something, something happened, and you decided that you're just going to live your own life, live it the way you want to live it. You're just going to go about your own business. And, uh, but you're here this morning because there's really been some challenges in your life. You're here this morning. You say, Pastor, I, I, I just want to rededicate my, my life to Jesus. I just want to rededicate my life to the Lord. If that's you this morning, would you lift your hand and let me pray with you? Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The third and final altar call, those other two are not closed. If you want to come, then that's fine with those. The last one is, Paul asked these 12 men. We jokingly say these were Baptists because they weren't filled with the Holy Ghost. But we realize that you don't have to be Baptist not to be filled with the Holy Ghost. But how important it is to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to have a prayer language that comes by being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so if that's you this morning, you say, you know, Pastor, I, I, I'm in the Word and I'm born again. 
but I'm not, I haven't been filled with the Spirit, and I don't have my prayer language. Would you pray with me for that release? As Paul laid hands upon them, they began to, to pray in a prayer language that was all their own. The Word calls it praying in tongues. But it's a prayer language that's just for you. If that's you this morning, I'd like to pray with you for, for that release. Because sometimes when we when we standing on the Word uh, and, and we just don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit will pray through us and pray in that prayer language the absolute perfect will of God for you. If that's you this morning, you, you've not experienced that, and we want to pray with you. Anybody like that here? Thank you, Father. Hallelujah.